May the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Special welcome to those who are joining us online. It's great to have you. Why do these things keep happening? Maybe, maybe it's happened to you. On your way home, the neighbor waves, you stop, and, hey, what'd you do this weekend? It's a softball question, an open door, but it's funny how rarely I went to church actually comes up in that conversation. Or maybe you've had it, your spouse drops the ball, forgets to pick up the kids, overdraws the bank account, or forgets your mom's birthday. You're not quite ready to let it go, and so you let them have it. Forgiveness, that's somewhere down the road. Or your boss takes credit for another one of your ideas. Accountability is nowhere to be seen. Incompetence it seems to be celebrated at work, and so you stew. A rage boiling under the surface, just ready to erupt. Why do these things keep happening? It's just a day in the life. Unless you claim the name of Jesus, because then you know that cowardice and resentment and rage are about as far from the fruits of the Spirit as you can possibly get. So why do they keep popping up like dandelions in the yard? Except these dandelions are dangerous. They're deadly. Weeds that can choke out the seeds of faith. What are you going to do? Mark wants to answer that question for you. That's why he recorded this eyewitness record of the life of Jesus. Why he traveled with Peter. Why he was a disciple of Paul. Because he wants to help you answer, how do I get rid of these dandelions? But he does it in a surprising way. You won't find in the eyewitness record of Mark a listicle. Ten ways to deal with your spouse. Three keys to better understanding your boss. Instead, he paints a picture. A grand, majestic, mysterious picture. And one he doesn't waste any time getting into. Already here in Mark chapter 1, he's blocking out that painting, showing us who are going to be the main people of this painting. The main focus of this painting introduces us to Jesus in these words, and the Trinity, and Satan. But really, he wants us to be able to answer that question. And then he's going to spend the rest of the 16 chapters of his gospel adding texture and nuance so we can get rid of the dandelions. So let's dig in. What does Mark say in chapter 1? We'll be looking at verses 9 to 13. Let's just go verse by verse. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Pastor Paul last week talked all about John the baptizer, where he came from, and this baptism laid it out. If you weren't here or want a refresher, go to our YouTube channel. It's a great place to, to find out more. It's enough for us to f- summarize it this week, just to say that John brought a baptism of repentance and forgiveness. A baptism that his main audience was completely fine with so long as it was for other people. For them, they were already the children of Abraham. Why do they need a baptism? But the more John held up for them the mirror of God's word, the more they saw how much they needed to repent of, how much they needed to confess, how much they needed forgiveness for. And so John preached it, they needed it, and down into the river they went. But that doesn't quite fit for Jesus, does it? I mean, he's not the one who needs forgiveness. He's not the one who needs the door of heaven opened. He can open it himself. When we teach middle school and high school students, prepare them to take communion, this is how we explain baptism. Baptism works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation. So why on earth was Jesus baptized? Did he sin? 
Did he need forgiveness? If you've been around Christianity, even for a minute, you're shouting in your head, no way! This is the perfect Son of God. He had obeyed God's will in everything, in how he thought, in his words, in his actions, every moment of his entire life, perfect. So why was he baptized? To be able to answer that question, we need to pan over to one of the other records of Jesus' life. Remember, Mark's not the only one. And especially helpful with this question in this moment is the eyewitness record of Matthew. So let's turn there. You see on the screens, on the left side is Mark, the passage we just read. On the right side is Matthew. Same exact event, just told from a different perspective. And you'll notice that even John recognized the absurdity of the moment. Jesus, you're the one that's perfect. I'm the one who's sinned. You need to baptize me, not the other way around. But notice what Jesus says. It's good for me to be baptized. In order to fulfill all righteousness. That's an odd turn of phrase for Jesus to use. What exactly does he mean? You have to remember who John was. He was the baptizer. He came out of the wilderness. A man who wore strange clothes and ate a strange diet. But underneath all of that, he was a prophet. And a prophet took the message from God and brought it to God's people. He relayed God's will to the people who needed to hear it most. And it was God's will that the people should be baptized. Baptism was not optional. It's not like John was standing on those riverbanks saying, hey guys, if, um, if you find it in yourselves and you, you would like to be baptized, that'd be great. But if not, that's okay. We'll see. No, that's not, not how this baptism worked. This was commanded by God. And Jesus obeyed every command that came from God. Even this one. He would be perfect. He would be righteous. That's the first reason he was baptized. The second, this serves as a turning point, this baptism. Before the baptism, we don't have a lot of backstory. There's not a lot of origin story for Jesus. We know how he was born, and then we get one little snippet, a story from when he was 12 years old, and that's it. But all that changes here. Starting with his baptism, we hear all about what he did, what he said, where he went, who he spent time with. This became the beginning of what's known as public ministry, which fit into the culture at the time. A Jewish man in the first century could not be considered a teacher, a rabbi, an authoritative figure until he was age 30. And that's exactly how old Jesus was. So this baptism serves as a sort of coronation of the crown prince, right? The crown prince is always the crown prince. From the moment he's born, he's the heir to the throne. But at the coronation, what was privately real became publicly known. And this begins for Jesus, a public ministry, teaching, preaching, healing, and ultimately saving. That's the second reason Jesus was baptized. The third is you. Jesus came to earth to put on your shoes and walk in them. And he would walk every mile you've ever walked, including baptism. One commentator puts it this way. He says, in the first act of his ministry, the one who had no sin publicly identified himself with those who had no righteousness. The sinless lamb submitted to a baptism designed for sinners. A foreshadowing of the fact that he would soon submit himself to a death deserved by sinners. In other words... Here in his baptism, he takes your place. He puts on the coat of your Savior, Savior from, sin, from shame, from guilt, from loneliness, from fear, from anxiety, from sin. So that for all those times that you've made Jesus too small, he became bigger than you could ever imagine. For all those times you pushed him aside and said, Jesus, let me do it. He had already done it for all those times. 
that you tried to earn daddy's approval, he already had it. That's what Mark tells us next. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Here he is, the triune God, the Son coming up out of the water. The, the Spirit descending like a dove onto and into Jesus, just like he fluttered over the waters of the deep before creation. The Father's voice booming from heaven, not calling into existence uh, light or the sun or water or trees, but calling into existence the mission of his Son. Speaking to his pride, to his love for his Son, to the commissioning of his Son. You know what's crazy? For all the times that we talk about this triune God, we just said those words, I believe in God the Father, I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in the Holy Spirit. For all the times that we talk about it, I'm not sure we really believe it. And I understand why. You and I, we want a God that's explainable. That fits into a box. A God I can get my arms around. Because if I can get my arms around him, then I can move him. I can direct him. I can tell him where I need him and where I don't. And so, too many times I compress God. I make him one that just shows himself in three different ways in the way that I most need. Where I divide him, rip apart three different gods. There's Jesus, the the cool God. Be fun to hang out with. Maybe I could get a beer with with him. There's the father who stands in the corner, arms crossed, scowling, ready to catch me. There's the spirit, some sort of vague force that helps me wield the lightsabers of life. Or I stratify God. I, I tear him that the Father God is real God and Jesus and Holy Spirit, well, they're just, they're just playing catch up. But when I make God that small, it has consequences. Whether I compress him, divide him, or stratify him, it makes a God who's too small, so small that he has nothing to say about life, about my world. It's only the triune God who's big enough, who has the power to save he, only the triune God is big enough for your grief, deep enough for your troubles, powerful enough for your sin. Any other way of thinking about God, any other God, and at best you have a cheerleader when what you actually need is someone to transform you. Any other way of thinking about God, and at best you have someone who watches you on your hard days, when what you actually need is someone who has the power to inject joy into your hard days. Any other way of thinking about God. And at best you have a God who walks away, and washes his hands on your hard days, in your scary times, in your loneliness, in your shame, when what you actually need is someone who is powerful enough, big enough, to lift that off of your shoulders and put it on his any other God and your prayers, your praise, your worship, it's a delusion. Because only this triune God is big enough to save. The hope, the peace, the joy, the the purpose, the mission that you long to have, it only comes if God is big enough, if He's far bigger than I am. That's the God who shows up in this baptism. Notice what he does. There's one. Eternal, uncreated, all-powerful, all-knowing, fully present everywhere, and yet he presents himself in three persons. Not three gods, there's not three fathers, there's not three sons, there's not three spirits. They are equal in every way. None is bigger or better. None is inferior or superior. And each of them has a role to play in this rescue mission that Jesus embarks on. Don't think that this is some 
backdoor deal that Jesus is doing something behind the back of his Father in heaven. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all planned this from this rescue mission from all of eternity, and they each are integral to this plan to bring you into the family, to save you. Which makes it weird what Jesus does next, unexpected at the very least. You would think if this starts his public ministry where he's going to teach and preach and heal and do all those things, then why does he go off by himself? But that's exactly what Mark records for us. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. The Spirit pulled on his shirt and took him out into the wilderness. And this is designed for us to be a, a mirror image bookend, to evoke memories of another man who walked in a different place and was tempted in the same way. Adam, the first man ever created. Adam walked in a lush garden with plenty, knowing satisfaction and being filled. Jesus walked in a wilderness where there was nothing and emptiness and knew only lack. Adam walked among the wild beasts for whom violence was Foreign. Jesus walked among the wild beasts for whom violence was ordinary. Both were tempted. Both saw angels show up after the temptation. But where Adam fell, Jesus stood. He said no to every one of those temptations so that he might be the second and far better Adam. But even in that there is a perplexing mystery, a perplexing paradox. And while Mark moves past it quickly, we can't. Because we know who this is. So he goes out in the desert to be tempted. But again, how? Jesus' half-brother James writes that when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil. God can't be tempted. So how could Jesus be tempted? And yet, a little bit later on, the author to the Hebrews says that um, we have one, Jesus, who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet was without sin. This is not a small thing. Here in Jesus, we see something extraordinary, something unique. He is... God and man, not 50-50, not a mixing the two, not first one, then the other in a, some sort of flip-flop, but he is 100% God and 100% human. It's the only way he could go out into the desert. He had to be fully human in order for him to be able to even be tempted. Remember what James says. And he went out into that wilderness as full God so that he could say no to every one of those temptations. Remember what the author of the Hebrews says. Here we see in Jesus, not something simple, explainable, small. We see something unique and extraordinary. A Savior who could have shown up in no other way. And that's what Mark wants to show us. He wanted to show us the answer to this question, why do these things keep happening? He wanted to show us the one and only weed killer. There are no ten options or three keys outside of the one three-person trinity. He had to be fully God in order to lift the weight of the sins of the world, your sins and my sins. In order to say no to every temptation, he had to be fully human so that he could be born under law, so that he could be tempted, so that he could take your place. This is the only way he could be. If you and I were going to be saved. This is the real God. Too big, too mysterious, too majestic. This is the God who loves you, who sees you, who rescues you. Amen.